I'll call the meeting to order of the Senate State Government Finance and Policy and Elections Committee, today being Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. Welcome everybody to the committee hearing today. We have a very full agenda with important topics as we always do. Uh, but with that, we're gonna go ahead and get right down to business. And Ms. Wilson, if you go ahead and take the roll. Senator Kiffmeyer. Present. Senator Howe. Present. Senator Carlson. Present. Senator Clausen. Present. Senator Fateh. Senator Curran. Present. Senator Pratt. Here. Senator Osmick. Senator Fateh. Senator Osmick. We have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. We have a quorum. All right, with that, members, we're going to go ahead and start with our first bill. And this is Senate File 3665. I'm sorry, Senate File 3680, Senator Lang. Welcome to the committee, and I'll move your bill to present it for us. And when you are ready, you can state your name for the audio record and then proceed with your testimony. Senator Lang. Well, good morning, Madam Chair and members. Uh, again, Senator Andrew Lang, I'm here presenting this morning uh, Senate File 3680. Uh, and prior to probably getting into the meat of it, Madam Chair, I think we should probably try to move the A4 amendment, which is a delete all. Okay, Senator Coran moves the A4 amendment to Senate File 3680. Uh, we're going to wait just a moment so members can all have a copy of the amendment in front of them. And members, to call your attention, this is a delete all amendment. So work off of the amendment. Senator Lang, is this the first hearing for your bill? Th th this is not, Madam Chair. This is the second hearing. So it's gone through transportation. Okay. Then we'll need you to um, explain your amendment. Has it been posted? It's posted. And it's been uh, distributed. Pretty well complete here. With that, Senator Lang, why don't you go ahead and, and describe the A4 amendment? Th thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, the A4 amendment being a delete all, I think I will just start into the testimony of the bill as a whole. Uh, the bill is actually a, a reaction and a, oftentimes in the legislature I found myself trying to fix things that we messed up earlier. Uh, when we went through the Real ID uh, process through the last uh, several years and we worked on uh, the Privacy Act as we've gone through the Real ID process, um, part of that reactionary note that the legislature took was to take uh, privacy items uh, in the end. In, in particular, there were some high profile cases that came out of those privacy items where police officers or other individuals were, were looking up in their other individuals' names. I'm sure some of you all remember those, those cases. Um, what the department did is say that you know, they put a, a number of strict regulations in place saying that that can no longer be done. Um, the problem with that, the problem with those regulations is that uh, the fallout from it was, uh, and this is a particular circumstance where a deputy registrar in my district uh, bought tabs or sold tabs to each other to self-employees within the deputy registrar's office because the next deputy registrar was 30, 40 miles away. Uh, per the department rules and regulations, that was uh, illegal or uh, uh, unauthorized. The follow from that is they lost their deputy, lesson, uh, deputy registrar license. They lost their business uh, for the department. So what this bill, and this is the second amendment, we've been working with both uh, the transportation chair, Senator Newman, and the department trying to come to some sort of a conclusion as far as the bill is concerned and how does that deputy registrar uh, abide by the rules and still allow what, what I would consider a, uh, a simple uh, re regulatory uh, fix as long as allowing uh, what, again, what I would consider uh, simple doing of business in, in a normal state of affairs while not uh, uh, breaking the law in any way, maybe, shape, or form. So what that means, the A4 amendment. The A4 amendment, uh, there's a, some substantial changes actually as it comes to uh, the, this, the A4 department, uh, as long as the department is concerned, this allows them to not only uh, revoke or allow that license to continue, but allow some disciplinary action other than. Uh, if you can see on 
page two lines uh, 2.17 to 2.19, it does address that uh, a little more in specific detail. Um, members, I guess that is the bill in its entirety. Um, I, and Madam Chair, I think I would stand for some questions at this point. Uh, I do have, if, if you'd like to, the Minnesota Automobile Dealer Association does. Uh, Senator Lang, first we're going to apply the amendment y yes, to Madam the bill, Chair. and then you have explained your bill, then next we'll go to testifiers. So members, um, I will move the A4 amendment to Senate File 3680 as explained. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. The A4 amendment is adopted. Thank you, Senator Lang. And yes, I would go ahead and if you have a testifier. Here she is. Welcome and again state your name for the audio record and your title, then proceed with your testimony. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus. I'm Vice President of Public Affairs with the Minnesota Automobile Dealers Association, and we represent Minnesota's 375 franchise new car and truck dealers. Uh, we're very grateful to Senator Lang for bringing this bill forward. Um, unfortunately, the law as it was created back when we passed Real ID it was very strict. It wanted to revoke access of anyone with an unauthorized lookup. Um, but we found that a lot of dealership personnel have been caught in the crosshairs because they will use the system for a legitimate business purpose, but the DPS policy goes beyond just limiting access for legitimate purpose, business purposes. Um, it prevents you from looking up your own record, that of a family member or that of a coworker. So if somebody at the dealership is trying to buy the car, then there's nobody that could process that information. Folks were doing it un unwittingly knowing that they were violating the law and losing their access to the system, which means they were losing their job. So we appreciate that this bill allows people to do lookups for legitimate purpose, business purposes and then provides um, a disciplinary action beyond just immediate revocation of their authority to access the data. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Backus. So uh, it's understandable that at that time, <laughs> the reaction to a violation was very mm -hmm. serious and important, not unusual sometimes then to be in this kind of a situation. Having read the language, uh, the real key thing is if an, if an um, authorized individual access, accesses data does not result in a completed transaction. So that would, this would be what I would consider a lookup. Um, what would be the business need for doing a lookup? like this for those of us who may not understand all your business processes. Ms. Backus. Sure, Madam Chair and committee members. So for instance, maybe um, somebody is thinking that they are going to buy a new vehicle and trade in their own vehicle. So then you start to look up the record of that trade-in um, to see if there's a lien on it that needs to be paid off to make sure that they're the owner or something like that. But then that customer either decides not to use trade in their vehicle or they don't go forward with the purchase itself. Um, that would be a lookup that would happen, but there would be no formal transaction because the sale didn't go through or the trade-in wasn't, didn't occur. Okay. And, and Madam Chair, I would add. That Senator Lang. We, thank you, Madam Chair. When the uh, deputy registrars, uh, I think, are, are in, in case of, are my tabs good? Uh, can you look my tabs up and see if they're good because they're not on my plate? I don't remember purchasing them. Uh, this is where I found myself in a, a similar situation. My tabs were good between the time I bought them and when they got to the plate, they got lost. So I, I, I couldn't remember. So, well, we can't look that dad up. <laughs> puts you in a, kind of between a rock and a hard place. We're not, we're not gonna put our license in, in jeopardy. So mm -hmm. this allows them uh, legitimate business concerns, mm -hmm. uh, legitimate business purposes, and uh, hopefully without, it allows the department a little leeway mm -hmm. as far as uh, fulfilling the, the law is concerned. Right. Well, I appreciate the fact. I think the, the key thing is authorized. In other words, it is a legitimate business purpose, legitimate business need, but I also like the fact that they include a notation. So there's a log and a record of such things, which I think is an important one to commit. The rest of it is just a process of the disciplinary action kind of a thing. Those are my questions. Anybody else have a question in regards to this bill? I'm not seeing any at this time. Uh, so Senator Lang, um, we're going to, uh, I will move that Senate file 3680 as amended be recommended to pass and to be re-referred to the Civil Law and Data Practices Committee. 
on that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Lang, you are on your way to civil law. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and members. I appreciate it. And thank you, Senator Lang. The next bill on our agenda today, we're going to go down on the agenda to Senate File 3065, Senator Matthews. Welcome, Senator Matthews. Glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good to be with you this morning. So I will move Senate File 3665. Uh, to put it before the committee and Senator Matthews. Um, I pulled the wrong one out. Thank you, Senator Matthews. I had my uh, packet. 3065, okay, and Senator Matthews, uh, I'll move Senate file 3065 in front of us today, and do you have uh, any amendments? Yes, Madam Chair, there's an A2 amendment if the committee is willing to consider it. Mm -hmm. And Senator Matthews, is this your first hearing? Uh, no, Madam Chair, it's not. Okay. All right, uh, then Senator Matthews, if you go ahead and would ex uh, we're passing out the amendment. Mr. Bjorn, has it been posted? Yes, it's been posted. All right. It is the A2 amendment to Senate File 3065. Senator Matthews, would you go ahead and start uh, explaining the amendment? Sure, Madam Chair. Uh, the A2 amendment uh, will engage the legislature if a state agency decides to adopt another state's rules. Uh, in this case, uh, the agency would have to give notice to the relevant committees in the legislature 90 days before publishing their intent to adopt the rules, and the legislature would also have to vote to approve uh, the proposed rule. I believe this action is important because of testimony we've been hearing from uh, agencies like the MPCA who have said that they believe they have broad authority to implement uh, any rule regarding emissions uh, without legislative direction to do so, and they could unilaterally uh, adopt any standard from California or elsewhere that would regulate other items like heavy-duty trucks or lawn equipment. And uh, if that is the case, we are under federal law required to take the rules wholesale without modification. So this amendment uh, would bring this back to legislative approval and would give the voice back to Minnesotans uh, for the debate through their elected uh, legislators. So that is the reason why we have uh, brought forward the A2 amendment today, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Matthews. And members, this is not a delete all. It's an addition to the bill, Senate file 3065. I'll move Senate file eight, uh, the amendment. I'll move the A2 amendment to Senate file 3065. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Matthews, now to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the bill includes uh, what is listed as section two on your bill is uh, the new addition to the version of the bill of uh, this year for the Consumer Choice of Fuel Act. And basically will state that a state agency may not adopt rules that restrict a type of product uh, that can be purchased or sold in Minnesota based on its fuel source. And this intends to go at uh, other forms of equipment such as generators, lawn mowers, uh, uh, pressure washers, leaf blowers. Uh, it would include recreational vehicles such as motorcycles, snowmobiles, watercraft, uh, and then additionally uh, includes the uh, the sections banning the California CARS rulemaking standards that we have heard in other bills in the past. 
And just briefly, Madam Chair, uh, we've had these discussions before, but this is essentially uh, to help correct a separation of powers issue, to correct uh, the efforts to go around the legislative process in our policy making uh, here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, this is based in the statute that you have listed in your bill. Uh, the statute gives allowance for uh, the department to regulate uh, the levels of air emissions from vehicles and to recognize that not one standard can be applicable in all parts of the state, that uh, the standard needed in one part of the state may be different than what's needed in the other part of the state. And the rulemaking as it's been passed and enacted by the agency does not fit within uh, that statutory requirement as the rules have stretched forward uh, outside those bounds to include the types of products that dealers and others will be required to have in stock on their businesses and be required to offer for sale. And we've gone over how uh, this will impact the cost of all vehicles, not just the electric vehicles. Uh, we've talked about um, uh, we've talked about how uh, this goes around the legislature. Uh, and it is not the role of government uh, to mandate what types of products should be sold through rulemaking. And if those decisions do need to be made and do need to be acted, enacted in Minnesota, they should be done through the legislative process in passing a law. Um, Madam Chair, the uh, California CARS standards have already been modified again in the state of California and so they are essentially moot here in Minnesota before they've basically even been enacted. And uh, the agency will be put in a position again as California has gone even further uh, with what their rules will incorporate out in California. The agency will be um, uh, put in a position again to decide whether they're going to, by rulemaking, adopt the further standards uh, California has now gone to all the way to the banning of, um, of gas-powered vehicles in the state of California by 2035. And Minnesota is going to be put in a position of whether they're going to uh, take that additional step and adopt uh, those standards because the standards that they have adopted are, no, are, are moot and no longer relevant. And uh, these are clearly choices that should be made here in the legislature. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, uh, this is uh, a similar bill that we've heard before with some new sections uh, added this year. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or go to our testifiers. Thank you very much, Senator Matthews. Uh, questions, members? Otherwise, um, I think I prefer uh, to go to our testifiers and our first one that I have on the list here is Mr. Reynolds. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Madam Chair. And your name and title for the audio record. Uh, good morning, everybody. John Reynolds. I'm the state director for the National Federation of Independent Business in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, we're the state's largest small business organization with over 10,000 members in every corner of the state and over 70% uh, over of our members have fewer than 10 employees. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you uh, to Senator Matthews for authoring Senate File 3065. NFIB uh, uh, members strongly oppose fuel source bans. Uh, in fact, we surveyed our members that this winter, 95% of them uh, rejected the notion of any unit of government banning uh, any type of fuel source. Uh, quite simply because one size fits all mandates don't work on Main Street. Uh, they don't work for small business owners uh, who need the flexibility to make the best and, and most affordable decisions for themselves and their employees. Uh, so we're glad to support Senate File 3065. Um, we also believe that uh, these decisions should be made by the people who are elected to represent the citizens of Minnesota and not faceless bureaucrats uh, appointed in California. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Our next testifier is uh, Ms. Amber Backus. Welcome back, Ms. Backus. 
Thank you again, Madam Chair and committee members. I appreciate the time to speak to this bill, and I also thank Senator Matthews for bringing it forward and the committee for your interest in the issue of the California cars rulemaking. Um, the auto dealers of Minnesota have no problem with electric vehicles. Our dealers are all in for EVs, and many are in the process of investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in their dealerships to get ready to sell them. But our problem is that the MPCA decided adopting California's low emission vehicle and zero emission vehicle standards was the way to get more EVs on the road, and the rulemaking process they used to adopt the standards is a flawed one. The MPCA claims that California CARS is part of an all of, ab all of the above strategy to address electrification of the transportation system and climate change. Yet doing so via rulemaking left the agency unable to include any of the other strategies to accelerate electric vehicle adoption, like purchase incentives and investments in a robust charging infrastructure, which are needed to overcome the two biggest barriers to electric vehicle adoption, upfront, upfront cost and charging anxiety. When commenters asked about these issues and others like the impacts of Minnesota's electric grid or biofuels industry during the rulemaking, the oft-repeated refrain from the MPCA was, that's beyond the scope of the rulemaking. However, the legislative process does not limit the scope of the conversation and can examine all impacts of a proposed policy and ways to mitigate them. And while public testimony was taken during the rulemaking process, it did not distinguish between who was making the comments or their validity. For example, the comments of a lone auto dealer from Maine, which I don't know why he cared about this, but he was there testifying, that was given the same weight as the trade association representing 375 of Minnesota's new car and truck dealers. A story from a consumer about trying to buy an EV in 2015 when there were very few models was treated as though they'd encountered the same choices today when there are, are over 30 EV models available here. But the most frustra frustrating aspect of all of this is that the facts on the ground have completely changed since the California CARS rule was adopted. When the administrative law judge determined that the rule was needed and reasonable, the feds had proposed weaker greenhouse gas emission standards and California only required 7% of vehicles available for sale to be electric. But in less than the year, the feds are planning to move forward with vehicle greenhouse gas emission standards even more stringent than California's, providing health and environmental benefits beyond what the California rule does. The underlying needs for the rule, a slowing climate change, improving health, and preventing backsliding are no longer relevant as the feds have addressed them. At the same time, California is moving to completely ban the sale of gas-powered vehicles and is proposing electric vehicles to be 26% of the vehicles offered for sale in 2025, one year after the California CARS rule goes into effect here. And while the agency says that change, that change would require an additional rulemaking that they might not pursue, it puts Minnesota dealerships and our customers in a very awkward position, as they don't know what future to plan for, the one where the market drives electric vehicle purchases or a mandate is forced on dealers. And if the rule is only going to be in effect for a year, as the agency has alluded to in prior testimony, what's even the point of going forward right now? We ask that you support this bill as amended to stop the California CARS rule and put legislators who give all Minnesotans a voice back in charge of such major policy decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Backus. Uh, members, those are testifiers and the presentation of the bill. Would there be any questions or comments? Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, um, Madam Chair and Senator Matthews, uh, when you talk about the freedom to use uh, fuels uh, as for a person who has um, some sort of a motor power vehicle or uh, um, you know a hobby, does that include the uh, two cycle motors? You know, two cycle uh, has been popular on. Uh, outboard motors, and I think that we've got we've had bands. We've had bands that are municipal. We've had bands that are statewide. There's bands uh, across the nation because two-cycle uh, gasoline with um, oil mixed in it is a, a major pollutant for our waters. Would you say that that fits in this particular definition as well, Senator Matthews? Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Carlson. Unfortunately, I don't use boats enough to know the specifics uh, personally, but I would say uh, the, if, the, if, if those regulations are passed through either state or local ordinance means, 
Uh, I believe those would continue to be legitimate. What we're going after here is ones that come basically from the bureaucratic arm of government. And that's why I would differentiate that between whether there's a law we pass at a state, whether there's an ordinance that a local jurisdiction uh, has posted. Those aren't the ones that we are going after. The ones we're going after is basically from unelected state bureaucracy that have a broad sweeping impact on everyone. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Yes. Senator Carlson. And uh, Madam Chair, and, and I'm not sure if I can ask this of uh, Senator Matthews, but uh, I'd like to hear what the administrative law judge said in their opinion. And I'm wondering if we have anybody in the audience here that can describe some of that. Uh, because we've had, um, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about this over the last year, year and a half. And uh, we've talked about mandating stocking automobiles. We've talked about you know, the losses of automobiles, if, or losses to the dealerships if automobiles are not sold, uh, things like that. And then now we're talking about a change in, in uh, one state's uh, interpretation of their own law being something that we're going to have to adopt. And I don't think we have to adopt that. So I guess I'd like to see if we have anybody from uh, MPA, M, uh, MPCA that can speak to what's going to happen in the future and how we got to where we are today. Uh, Senator Carlson, uh, Senator Matthews, do you want to try to respond to that? And my understanding is I don't think, I don't know if anyone is here from the MPCA today. There's no one from the MPCA today. Senator Matthews? No. Oh, Me. somebody has? Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, Senator Matthews, go ahead. Madam Chair, um, the the administrative law judge did say, I'm sure uh, the department can give the correct terms, that it was uh, needed and relevant. Uh, my argument has been, uh, I believe that the ruling that they gave was just simply incorrect based on the uh, plain reading of the statute that we have in hand that uh, authorizes the rulemaking authority uh, by the commission. Um, judges have made wrong rulings in the past. Those have been corrected in the future or overturned or overruled. Legislatures have made wrong decisions in the past. Those have been changed and laws have been, uh, been undone or redone uh, by future legislatures. And uh, I, I still contend that based on the plain reading of the statute, um, it is a big stretch to go from regulating the emissions level of vehicles uh, that is in statute today and jump from there to regulating the types of products that you must carry on your lot. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to have uh, the department uh, give their further explanation as well. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and title for the audio record and then proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Craig McDonald, Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And to Senator Carlson's question there, the administrative law judge did find the rule needed and reasonable and found that the MPCA did conform with all of the requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act um, in regards to the cost analysis. So the needed and reasonableness basis of the administrative law judge was based on that analysis, which did show overall cost savings to consumers who purchase zero emission vehicles, as well as reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and other harmful air pollutants. The administrative law judge also made a finding that the MPCA does have the authority to move forward with this based on the statute that Senator Matthews' bill references, 116.07. So Mr. McDonald, though, just to clarify, uh, you present to the administrative law judge the statement of need, the sonar. Uh, you are required by uh, to present that. That is your writings that you present uh, in rulemaking to the administrative law judge. Is that not correct? Madam Chair, that is correct, and the administrative law judge takes that into consideration in making their decision. And so what you're referring to is the ALJ, in its ruling, agreed with you. Is that correct, Mr. McDonald? Madam Chair, that is correct. Yeah. So I just want to clarify for those who may be watching, um, the ALJ um, read the sonar, as Senator Matthews has said, he believes the ruling was incorrect in accordance with that, but this was something that the MPCA wrote to the ALJ. Senator Carlson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, this is uh, for Mr. McDonald. Uh, uh, is that decision appealable? Uh, Madam Mr. Mc 
Mr. McDonald. Madam Chair, um, it could be appealable to, I believe, a court of appeals, but um, nobody has appealed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Senator Matthews, uh, anything else at this point? Uh, I, I have another committee member with a question, so okay. Senator Osmick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. McDonald, um, you know, we talk about pollution and air pollution and uh, the pollutants that are resulting from uh, burning fossil fuels. Um, did the MPCA or anyone uh, take into account the pollution that occurs in lithium mines around the world? Mr. McDonald? Madam Chair, um, specifically to the lithium mines and pollutions there, that was out of the scope of the rulemaking. We considered this the vehicle emission standards there. However, we have discussed uh, some of the results of lithium mining and potential impacts there as well, recognizing that that's the role of the federal government to really make sure that we are have strong trade agreements and other things that are dealing with potential labor issues or environmental pollution. Senator Osmick? Well, I'll... I'll uh point to a few things, I'm rather shocked that uh, you take into account the pollution from a carbon-based uh, a carbon-based machine or, or engine, but you're not going to take into effect the massive devastation and pollutions that's created by lithium mines. Uh, members, if you, you know, do a simple Google search, which I did and took me about 10 seconds, uh, lithium mine extraction uses 500,000 gallons of water to create a, a metric ton of lithium. Um, it describes in very good detail how this process works, but the result is polluted water around the world, as well as devastation to uh, fish. I know a lot of people like to talk about the uh, the precious metal mines up on the that, that are proposed up north, and how they would be devastating to streams and rivers and to the fish population. Well, there's pictures of dead fish that have been caught in the runoff of lithium mines, as well as cattle who drink the poison water. So, I am I'm amazed that we decide we're going to, at the MPCA, take one side of an equation and not vet both sides and what the devastation is to this planet on actual mining, not much less the fact, what are we going to do with expended lithium batteries or that, that are not recyclable, that have to be put into, uh, uh, put into uh, uh, dumps, toxic dumps, that'll be there forever. So I'm very disappointed in the MPCA. And you have now admitted that you are not, the MPCA is taking one side of a story and not pursuing both sides of a story to make a decision. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Osmick. Anybody else? Uh, seeing nobody else at this time, Senator Matthews, one of the things, Senator Clawson, all right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a, a clarification, Senator Matthews. As I read this, this has pretty far-reaching implications for the future. It talks about a proposed rule uh, that has a reference of a statute or rule from another state must automatically be submitted to the legislature. Is that correct? Senator Matthews. Madam Chair, Senator Clausen, yes, that's correct. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so this goes beyond the clean car discussion that we're having today. It would be any rule. So we're really taking away the rulemaking process in this particular situation from the MPCA in this case. Uh, you know, that's been around for over 50 years. We've had that in place. If there was a reason for doing it is so that we have another means by which the public can test testify and provide um, their comments on a particular rule that is being considered. We have the administrative uh, law judge that then reviews that. Uh, I just think that 
because we don't at this time like this ruling that we're going to change the rules of the game has some pretty far-reaching implications that I have some real concerns about. Senator Matthews. Madam Chair, Senator Clawson, appreciate those comments. The amendment we adopted only applies to rules where an agency is grabbing a rule from out of state. Right. Uh, some, not all of the rulemaking processes are like that. Some are developed just solely within uh, the needs of this state. And I would also add, uh, yes, the statute's roughly around 50 years old or so. Uh, but the concept of rulemaking has seemed to take on almost a life of its own in the recent past. Uh, that does not seem to have been the case even decades ago when I was younger or uh, in ways that probably were not conceived back when this uh, statute was enacted. We're now seeing places where uh, things that should have been put in bill form and run through the legislature uh, for uh, rather than taking an existing policy and making rules on how to accomplish a policy already in rules. Uh, we're seeing in a multitude of areas, uh, agencies essentially setting brand new courses of public policy uh, outside and around the legislature and without them having uh, any input or accountability to the people uh, like you and I do with our election certificates if our uh, constituents believe that we're wrong on issues that we support here at the legislature, they have the opportunity to replace us. Uh, and that's not the case in the, uh, in the agencies. And uh, I, I don't believe it is proper uh, for the voluminous number of areas that they've gone out to set brand new public policy uh, simply through the rulemaking process. So that's what we are uh, seeking to rein in with this bill. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a question, uh, Senator Matthews. Do you know how many, how often this actually takes effect? In other words, how often during the rulemaking process are we adopting or looking at to adopt uh, a statute from another state? I'm just curious about how, how often may we be in this situation if your bill goes forward that we'd be referring to the legislature. Senator Matthews. Madam Chair, Senator Clausen, I wouldn't have those specific numbers off the top of my head. I just know, based on what I hear uh, going around the legislature and the agency actions now, that it does come up uh, from time to time, uh, but not in every rulemaking case. Some are generated solely within uh, the, the state uh, and, and the needs here. Um, and clearly ones like the California cars rulemaking and the additional ones they'll have to do in the near future since California has already modified those rules. Uh, those ones uh, clearly are uh, at least some instances where this is occurring. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Uh, what's interesting, I think it's important for us to remember, it is the legislature who gave rulemaking authority. All right. The legislature rules the rules. So it is the legislature who gave the authority, and the legislature has the absolute right to modify or remove or correct, as Senator Matthews is looking to do right now, any rulemaking. So this is not an absolute fiefdom where you're given rulemaking and therefore the legislature can never address those issues. That is absolutely, totally not correct. And so the legislature has the duty and the responsibility. And I would say, yes, Senator Matthews, that when general rule making was put in place those 50 years ago, it was for the implementation of where you didn't want to have all the details in statute. But we've gone way beyond that into where the le now the executive branch through rule making is actually working on legislating and overriding uh, in many cases. So. I think it's really important for us to recognize, though, that the authority of the legislature is above the rulemaking. And for us to now look at bills like this is absolutely appropriate, whether it's even with another state. And I think it's so telling here as well that I looked at the repealer um, that in uh, Rule 7023.0150 in the definitions, one of the definitions is California means Minnesota. 
Wow. California means Minnesota. I mean, even to the extreme that California means Minnesota. Uh, the question sometimes really relies upon are we a subsidiary of California or are we our own state? And last I knew, this is the state of Minnesota and we are Minnesota. And so just repealing that alone, Senator Matthews, would be well worth um, this effort. Uh, but it's so much more and those are the issues. So with that, members, I don't see any other hands raised or anything, so I'm going to move that Senate file 3065. Uh, before we go, I have a request for a roll call, and so we'll do a, I thought I heard somebody ask for that, Senator Graham, to do a roll call? Did yes, we'll request a roll call, Madam Chair. Okay, I thought I heard it before, okay. A roll call being requested, roll call granted. I will move Senate file 3065 as amended to be recommended to pass and be referred to general orders. On that motion, Ms. Wilson, take the roll. Senator Kiffmeyer. Aye. Senator Howe. Aye. Senator Carlson. No. Senator Clausen. No. Senator Fateh. No. Senator Curran. Yes. Senator Pratt. Aye. Senator Osmick. Aye. There being five ayes and three noes, uh, the motion prevails and Senate file 3065 as amended is on its way to general orders. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Madam Matthews. Chair. Our next bill that we will be taking next is Senate file 3665, Senator Coran. No need to welcome you to the committee today. Glad you're here. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'm ready to get rolling. All right, you Senator Coran, go ahead. And I, I see you have an amendment as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I'd like to move Senate file um, 3665. And then I'd also like to move the um, A1 amendment, the author's amendment to Senate file 3665. In the, uh, the amendment, okay. I guess it's an offer this amendment. We can speak about it after. On the A1 amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Coran, to your bill is amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I guess we can cover the amend amendment uh, quickly. Is that it just a technical correction? And if Ms. Stangle, she could cover the, okay. the um, Ms. Stangle. A1 amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, the amendment does two things. One, it fixes an improperly noted head note that has nothing to do with the bill, but it's a technical correction to make conforming language with the rest of the statute, and then it adds an immediate effective date. Um, so it will apply to all requests for data made on or after the day of enactment. Okay, thank you, Ms. Stengel. And the A1 amendment is adopted. Is there any other... Issues, Ms. Stengel? Okay, no, all right. Thank, thank you, Ms. Stengel. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair? Yes, Senator Grant. Um, so I'd like to, to move forward. And so with the, with the bill, I'm, I'm happy to be here to talk about 3665. And uh, it's really data classification of the statewide voter registration system. Uh, initially, we started out um, kind of just changing one word and, and looking at the, the need to make these changes. But it evolved in a much more comprehensive approach that makes it easy and very clear what the legislative uh, intent is around data privacy and uh, to ensure we have um, full data privacy, um, but also to ensure that we have um, public records requests that are met and, uh, and executed by our agencies. As we've seen over the past decade, multiple lawsuits have been filed um, due to the lack of transparency and compliance with the Minnesota Data uh, Privacy Act. It's literally one of the fastest growing requests from the Office of the Legislative Auditor, as well as the uh, administrative law judge process. 
when they fail to, to provide or to turn over the records which are statutorily um, and clearly allowed. In this case, we're focusing on one, one particular entity because of the seriousness of it and, and because many times we've talked um, about courts' rulings, I think in our, just the, the bill we just heard, talked about the, the rulings in the courts and the obligation for the legislature to govern and create clear statutory um, process and law as well as the intent, and I think this bill does that. For these reasons, the topic you know, is of our most, utmost importance and foundation of the right as a legal U.S. citizen in this state is our elections, and that's why I brought this forward. What this, what this does is it really updates the statute to clearly identify public versus private data and the legislative intent. These efforts will provide clarity to the Secretary of State and in our courts, if further conflict arises um, due to the lack of, of uh, compliance with what we believe is the, tr the proper translation of today's statutes. By doing so, we can ensure that all Minnesotans have faith in the election process by providing the transparency, security, and accountability of our state government. And with that, Madam Chair, um, this really does just look forward and say, we need to make sure to, that this process is so trustworthy that everybody believes in the results and transparency is the utmost foundation to that in every aspect of our government, certainly in the elections process. We've seen on both sides um, and, and all citizens over the past decade um, where those things come into question by being able to provide the public data that ensures the confidence in the process we can alleviate those fears so everybody can believe and trust in the results. So, Madam Chair, that's uh, the, the end of my testimony. Thank you, Senator Coran. Are there any questions or? Uh, Senator Coran, I, um, I think the Civil Law Committee will deal with more of the um, private data issues that may be in your bill. Is that correct? We're going to send it off to civil law? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Wonderful. Yes. So, uh, Senator Claussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a, a clarification, because right now a voter can, uh, with written request, can have their name removed for privacy. Would your bill affect that ability of a voter on their own accord to remove their name? Madam Chair. Senator Coran. Madam Chair, Senator Claussen. Um, in the, Ms. Stangle can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe um, the law today or the, the proposed changes um, changes any of those. In fact, I think it further clarifies or solidifies that an individual has the ability to request that privacy on an individual basis. Senator Coran, I believe it also is uh, pursuant to the fact that they're, they're safe, concerned for their safety or their safety or their family, and yes. that would involve safe at home program participants as well. Is that correct, Senator Coran? Yes, Madam Chair, it does not change those requirements because we do believe those are vital programs and the necessity for those very scenarios in which you described that that needs to remain in place. Okay. Senator Carlson? Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Cran, uh, you, you were saying that uh, we need this particular initiative to give more confidence to our our election system. Um, I, I agree that we need to have confidence in our election system, but sometimes what uh, our words are the, the things that drive non-confidence. And what I'm wondering is, uh, do you feel that we have a solid election system in Minnesota and that we can be we can rely on what the outcome has been in all districts, including yours and mine and the presidential election. Can we have confidence in that? And will you, will you state that we have confidence in our system being uh, solid and honest? Madam Chair? Uh, Senator Cran, well, I'm hesitating a little bit here. Senator Carlson, are you questioning a motive? I just want to be sure you're not, when you're asking a why, it's like a motive, why? What's your opinion or why this? So I just wanted to be careful. You're not asking that, correct? No, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, no, I'm asking if that we are expressing the, uh, the view that our, our system has, we have confidence in our system. I'm, I'm wondering if this will add to the confidence in that system 
and okay. if there is a non-confidence that this will take care of. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Senator Coran. Madam Chair and, and Senator Carlson, I do believe this does add to the confidence. And um, as we've seen over time, what we need to do is be able to trust and verify. That's why we have public data requests to make sure agencies are performing um, as it relates to statute and that we can go out and verify those things. Trust and confidence has been, as you stated, in words matter. And over the last, at least since my um, election six years ago, um, we've seen a continued effort to, um, to impact a system that we don't believe was broken, but to continue trying to weaken the checks and balances that ensures we have, in co have confidence in it. In the last couple of years, we've seen not only those actions that can't be taken care of um, in through, a, through a legislative process, which has been always bipartisan, those things have changed. We've sought courts to try and rewrite law, and this is the foundation to ensure that it's the basic premise, and I think everybody believes in that, that we want to make sure that only this, by providing this transparency and clarity in the courts, that we can validate that elections are are trustworthy and that the proof is available to prove that only eligible U.S. citizens, um, eligible people cast ballots in that election cycle. And that's what this does. Thank you, Senator Cran. Senator Carlson. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Cran, a, a little more detailed uh, question on your bill here. Um, if your bill passes, does that uh, require the Secretary of State to share information on those minor voters who have pre-registered and will be turning 18 by the next election. Senator Coran. Madam Chair, Senator Carlson, um, I don't, I don't see where that has been, um, where that's in the uh, statute from a minor perspective. Maybe Ms. Ms. Stangle can tell me uh, or provide clarity on minor voters that are registered, but I don't believe that's the intent because they haven't participated in an election process and have cast a ballot um, regardless of whether they're registered. Senator Coran, I'm going to ask Ms. Stangle in regards to the question here, um, does Minnesota allow those who are not eligible to vote by virtue of their age um, in Minnesota law. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm trying to pull up the statute here. I believe there's a small window where you can register before your 18th birthday, uh, but you can't register, for example, when you're like 16. So there's a small window where minors might be in the system, but it's only a, li a little bit of time. Thank you, Ms. Daniels. I recall as well, there's a small window before you turn 18 that is uh, uh, that is specific to your turning 18 on election day, uh, as Ms. Stangel said. That's what I recall as well. I thought that might be helpful to you. Yeah. Senator Carlson. Yeah, Madam Chair, I guess uh, what my question is, is, is is that in the data that the Secretary of State must share the uh, yeah. those yeah. people who are 17? I'll ask. Uh, uh, Senator Coran will answer that. I just wanted to clarify what current Minnesota yeah. law was, because it sounded like in your comment that you were thinking 16-year-olds could register to vote. Not yet. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Chair, Senator and, and, and with that, then based on, and again, Ms. Stangle can clarify, but if they fall into an eligible registrant within the system, um, it, likely they would fall under that data practices of the Privacy Act. Thank you, Senator Coran. Senator Claussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Following the 2020 election, uh, the Trump administration uh, requested that uh, all states turn over their voter data to the federal government for review with the allegation that the election was rigged. 44 of the states refused to do that. And I think that the bill that you're proposing right now kind of flies in the face of those 44 states that protecting voter information should remain in place, and I think your bill goes against that. So I'm, I'm going to vote no on this if it comes to a vote, and I think that uh, looking at what took place in the 2020 election and looking at those 44 states refusing to turn over voter information was the right decision. Madam Chair. Senator, Senator Coran, just a moment. Um, Senator Coran, um, do you get a public information list 
from the Secretary of State office for use in your campaign? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, Senator Coran, if you go ahead and answer Senator Claussen's question. Madam Chair, in, in Senator Claussen, and what this process um, clarifies is intent and what should be available. Protecting data that truly should be private data and, and making available, clarifying exactly what should be public data. Um, regardless of the requester, they would have to follow the proper procedures and policies to do so, but public data is public data by the very nature and the definition, and we're just trying to clarify that. It's about trust and verify across the board, and that's what this does. It provides the ability to provide that information, and again, um, it ties into a growing effort well beyond just the election process of citizen frustration across all state agencies and the lack of following the Data Practices and Privacies Act um, to provide that access to information that is classified by statute today public. Thank you, Senator Cran. I would mention, in addition to that, Senator Clausen, do you have a follow-up question or a comment? No. Um, no, Madam Chair, I think I made my point. Mm -hmm. I think the clarification here that's very, very important that all of us seated here at this table and any person who would like to have access to a public information list right now under current law is able to do so, including all senators at this committee table. You get that data. It's a public information list. And so that data is public no matter who requests it. I think that's an important consideration, but it's the right that we have as senators sitting here at the table. And uh, the, the requirement, though, is for political purposes. There's a note that you signed that you agreed to that's part of that. Uh, I would like to mention, though, that on that state voter registration list, when somebody pre-registers, the Secretary of State Office verifies the information with the Social Security Office, whether it's a driver's license or a Minnesota state ID. They go to the courts and check that information. We currently have a, a fairly extensive uh, trust but verify system already, and we have public information data already. So I just wanted to be sure that for anybody watching or listening at this point so that they are clear and understand what is also current law. So with that, any other questions or things? Seeing none, um, Senator Coran, closing comments on Thank your, you, Madam Chair. I think yeah. this is a good policy to ensure that, again, you just covered the trust and verify, and that's our job. And, and if we should trust and verify anything, it's about our elections process, and that's what this bill does. It makes it transparent and verifiable. And with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to move um, Move that Senate file 3665 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Civil Law and Data Practices Committee. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Aye. Motion prevails and is adopted. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you, Senator Coran. Members will go to our last bill on the agenda here shortly. Senator Kipmeyer, to your bill 3846, I see you have the A3 amendment. I do, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to move the A3 amendment to Senate file 3846. And that's an author's amendment? Yes, it is. To that, all those in favor of the A3 amendment, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Senator Kipmeyer, to your bill as amended. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So, members, uh, this bill is a housekeeping bill. Uh, it is a bill that is uh, coming from the Legislative Coordinating Commission, the LCC, 
and some of it is uh, technical cleanup language um, as well. And so I'm going to have um, okay. So, Mr. Chair, we did adopt the A3 amendment. Yes. Okay. Senator it just came, it was passed out to me here, and I, I just wanted to be sure that we took care of that. Thank you very much. So that is, I what I would like to do is have um, um, our testifier here that I have today, uh, the executive director of the LCC, if she would go ahead and uh, explain the bill. Please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Michelle Weber. I'm the executive director of the Legislative Coordinating Commission. The bill has uh, four provisions within it. The first provides authority for the executive director of the Legislative Coordinating Commission to enter into contracts on behalf of the legislature, um, the joint offices and commissions. And we also, in certain circumstances, we serve as a fiscal agent on behalf of the entirety of the legislature. So the broadcasting contract, for example, is entered into by the Legislative Coordinating Commission. The bill as amended would require that the executive director receive written approval from the chair and vice chair of the LCC prior to executing uh, any contracts. The second aspect to the bill includes some technical corrections to remove some outdated references to dates related to the Legislative Salary Council. <clears throat> That's the council that was created in the Constitution to establish the salary for legislative members. So there were some outdated um, references to dates that have passed. There's also some recognition of the appointment, when the appointments need to be made by. Um, in particular, they're made in the odd number year, and every four years that corresponds with the first term of the the first month of the first term of a governor, and so it provides that the appointments have to be made by January 15th, with the first meeting occurring by January 25th. We've also, as the amendment um, did this morning, it's also added an additional prohibition about who can serve on the council. That is in alignment with the prohibitions that are stated in the Constitution. So it pro prohibits an existing executive branch employee or judicial branch employee from serving on the council. The third provision in the bill um, relates to the Mi Mississippi River Commission Parkway. And the goal of the changes there um, were requested by the commission to uh, allow for the public members to serve four-year staggered terms. There's also some uncodified language to address um, the ex expiration of members' terms and moving to a staggered term schedule as the um, codified language for that commission <coughs> would do. And then finally, the bill proposes to repeal the Trustee Candidate Advisory Council. This is a group that hasn't met since 2012. There currently are no members on this group, and the group makes recommendations to the governor for appointments to the Board of Trustees for the Minnesota State College System. The um, language that's in the bill also just indicates some factors that the governor should take into consideration when making recommendations for appointment. The Senate retains authority to, con to make uh, their oversight authority with respect to approving those appointments. And that concludes my overview, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, yep. uh, closing comments. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, just to let you know, so Ms. Weber is the executive director of the LCC and works with all of these entities, and so um, in bringing these forward. But I also had a discussion with Senator Senjum. The governor's office uh, sent a request on some changes as well and things that they had input to, and Senator Rarick with the Higher Education Committee. So I did have those discussion in addition to Ms. Weber, and I think the bill as it is, is um, able to be adopted as we wish. Well, uh, thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. So members, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer moves that 3846 as amended be recommended to pass and re-referred to the Committee on Higher Education. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion carries. Your bill's on the way to higher ed.
Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I think that completes our business, if you'd like to uh, adjourn. With that completion of our agenda, uh, this, this committee stands adjourned.